So here we are with quartiles. Um, so quartiles, again, were the English, oops, the English language quartiles would be quarters. Like so, we're breaking the data into quarters when we talk about quartiles. So the first quartile marks the first fourth of the data. The second quartile is really kind of the half of the data. Um, so if you look at the data and, and like here's the minimum value and then the first quartile will mark the first fourth of the data and then the second quartile will mark the second fourth and that's also equal to the median because really that's going to be half of the data. And then you have the third quartile and then you have the maximum. So here's the minimum, first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, maximum. And you'll have a fourth of your data here, a fourth of your data here, a fourth of your data here, and a fourth of your data here. So the first quartile is considered to be the median of the first half of your data set. So if you looked at the first half of the data set only, then your median of the first half of the data set is going to be your first quartile. And then if you looked at the second half of the data set, then your third quartile would be the median of the second half of the data set. <coughs> and then your second quartile is equal to the median of the data set. Now there is some controversy, some debate, some disagreement on whether the median, if it's actually part of the data set, whether it should be included in both halves or neither. So if you've got the median that's part of the data set, do I include it, do I not include it? And if I do include it, I should include it in both halves. And if I don't include it, I shouldn't include it in either half. Your book includes it. So why says, yeah, include it. So when the median's part of the data set. And does anybody know a, a good rule of if you have so many data values, then the median will be part of the data set. And if you have so many data values, the median won't be part of the data set. Can anybody think of when that would happen and when it wouldn't happen? OK, so when we had 13 data values, the median was part of the data set, right? And then when we had 10 data values, we actually had to average. So the median wasn't part of the data set. So it turns out when you have an odd number of data values, the median will be that very center value because there will be an even number on either side. Um, and then when you have an even number of total data, data values, you're, there won't be one particular value in the center. There will actually be two that you would need to average. So if you have an odd number of data values, the book will say include the median in the first half and include the median in the second half when you do the counting. But your calculator and other um, books might tell you to do it differently. So if you're doing the calculator method, you're going to get a different answer for odd data sets, odd numbers of data sets, um, than you would by the book according to the book's method. Did you have a question? Yeah, you never, you never put the average in because you're only looking at the data values themselves, so you would never put the average in. Um, but it's only when you have an odd set of data values that um, Weiss says include that middle value in both halves. And the calculator and other people will say don't include that median in either half. Just include the stuff that's to the left of the median in the first half and the stuff that's to the right 
of the median in the second half, and that one data value never gets considered in either half. I will accept either method on the test, but to full course compass, <laughs> you'll, <laughs> you'll have to um, use the book method. Um, so you'd actually need to do this by hand um, to full course compass for um, values that have odd numbers of data in them. The median is always going to be the same by the calculator or by the book. It's that first and third quartile that would change. Right. Uh, we would have to have quantitative data to do mean, median, mode, um, quartiles, standard deviation range. We would need quantitative data. Um, the interquartile range is going to be, remember the range is the range of the whole data set. And so it's the maximum minus the minimum. The interquartile range, inter means within, so this means the range within the quartiles is actually the um, largest quartile, Q3, minus the smallest quartile. So, and this is probably a formula on your formula card under Chapter 3. It'll say IQR is Q3 minus Q1. So your interquartile range, Q3 minus Q1. And you'll have a lot of other formulas on your formula card too, including the S, defining and computing formula that we already talked about, and probably the formula for range and the formula for the sample mean. So a lot of formulas under Chapter 3. So if the range, the interquartile range, is the range of the middle 50% of your data, so how much spread is in the middle part of the data, it is more resistant to change than the um, range itself, because the range itself, you change one value and make it extra extreme, and that one value is going to significantly change the range. But it won't change the interquartile range because the interquartile range is just the middle 50%. So it won't consider the very extreme data values. So it's considered a resistant measure for that reason. Um, and again, what we just mentioned on the previous slide, um, how to identify Q1 and Q3. Some people say include the median when you count the first half, and some people say don't. The five-number summary is uh, very popular. It's what we use as the foundation for building our box plots, and it kind of tells us the spread of the data. So remember when I drew the picture earlier that our quartiles, um, Q1, Q2, and Q3, sort of split the data into fours, and then we had our minimum and our maximum. Well, that's what the five-number summary is. Since the median is equal to Q2, our five-number summary tells us how the data is split up into fours. It includes the minimum and the maximum, so we know where the quartiles stop and start. Um, and then, so the minimum, Q1, the median, Q3, and the maximum. This may be on your formula card as well. I'm not 100% sure, but it may be there. And it's certainly something you can add, because you can add anything you want on the printed side of the formula card. Again, our calculator will find the five number summary for us. Of course, it may not be the same as the book, and so therefore, of course, campus may not accept it as correct, but I would accept it as correct on um, tests and homework. It's fine to do it on homework as well, your paper homework. Um, the online homework, it may not accept it. But to do this on your calculator, you would, of course, want to enter your data into L1, and we'll do that. Um, let's suppose we already have, well, we probably want a larger data set than we have, right? You want to just make up some data? Okay. So... Um, we have 12, 15, 8, 10. Let's make up some other data. So 9, 
7, 5, 6, 3, um, 12, 13, sorry, um, 15. Okay, so that gives us a good amount of data. Um, does everybody have the same data entered that I just entered? Do you want me to scroll back up? Okay. Um, stat edit. So stat and then edit will get you to entering. Okay, so then we did 12, 15, 10, 8, 9, 7, 5. And then 6, 3, 12, 13, 15. Okay, are we good? Okay, and then once we've got the data entered, we will want to do stat and then scroll to calculate and then do one of our stats. Wait, we already did that for the um, standard deviation. Turns out that we use this one of our stats for lots of things. Press enter because it knows by default to use L1, so I don't even have to really tell it L1 if I don't want to. Um, and then it tells me my x bar, my sum, my sum of x squared, the s, the sigma, but I can scroll down. It tells me the number of data values I have, which are 12, 12 data values. And then it tells me the minimum, q1, the median, q3, and the maximum. So here my five number summary would then just be um, the 3, comma, let's see, 6.5, 9.5, and then 15. Is that what y'all got? Okay. And then if we do this by hand, um, we may, let's see, we may get something different, although it did say 12 data values, didn't it? So that's an even number of data values. So since we have an even number of data values, we'll actually get the same thing if we do it by hand here because our median is not part of the data set. Um, so if we do it by hand, um, we would list the data in order from least to greatest. Can somebody look at their calculator and tell me what the least data value is and then start giving me, I'm sorry, three, three, and then five. <coughs> Nine and 10. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So I do have twelve data values, and then um, oh, it would be nine and ten, yeah. So the sixth and the seventh data value. Because we then have one, two, three, four, five data values on this side, and one, two, three, four, five data values on this side. So nine and ten, average those together, gives us the nine and a half that's our Q2 or median. And then our first half of the data set would be from what to what? Three to nine. Okay, so. This is the first half. And then the median of the first half of the data set would be, yeah, the six and the seven are in the center, so we average those to get 6.5. And I actually put 9.2 here, sorry. It should be 9.5. And then the second half of the data set goes from Yeah, 10, 
up to the last 15, so that's the second half. And then the middle of this is going to be, yeah, the 12 and 13, which average to be 12.5. And then the minimum data value is this 3, and the maximum data value is the 15. And so um, if we have the five number summary, it's going to be 3, 6.5, 9.5, uh, 12.5, and 15. Are there any questions on that? You look like you have a question. Okay. Can I, are we ready to move? Okay. Here's another data set, 9262174. Um, what is the median and how would we find it? Yeah, put it in order. So the least is 2 and then 4 and then 6, 9, 17. Here we have an odd number of data values. So the median is going to be the 6, right, and so it's going to be part of the data set. So the median is 6. Um, using the book method, what would Q1 be? 3. N no, the book method. The calculator doesn't include the median. But the book method does, right? Let me make sure. We'll scroll back and make sure. Yeah, your book includes the median in the first halves, um, whereas the calculator includes it in neither. So the book does include the median, and the calculator does not. So if we're using the book method, Right. Okay. Um, not six, but the four. So the first half includes the six, and so the median of the first half of the data is four. So that's our, whoops. That's our Q1. And then the second half of the data set is going to be what to what? 6 to 17, and the Q3 would be 9. So um, 4 and 9. Are there any questions on this? <laughs> oh, such is life, I guess. They can't decide, can't agree. Um, the interquartile range is going to be, so for the interquartile range, it's Q3 minus Q1. Q3 in this case is 9. Q1 is 4. So 5 it is. And then the five number summary, we put curly brackets around it. And what's the minimum? 2 and then Huh, how about that? Um, so, will that always be the case? No. For using the book method, for doing a five number summary and you have a data set that's five values, this actually will always be the case. Um, but if you have six values or four values or anything other than five values, it won't be the case. And then if we did this by the calculator method, we'd probably get a different answer, right? Since they just look at 2 and 4 and average those and get 3 and look at 9 and 17 and average those and get 13. So it would actually be 2, 3, 6, 13, 17 if you did it on the calculator. 
And did anybody do it on the calculator and get that? <laughs> you want to do it on? Okay. Well, for a small data set, yeah, it kind of is. Okay, so here we have um, obtain the quartiles and interpret the quartiles and determine and interpret the interquartile range. So we have um, an odd or an even number of data values. So this will give us the same answer by calculator or by book method. Which do we want to use? Okay, let's go ahead and use the calculator for that one. Again, if you were in Course Compass, you would want to use the book method because that way you will match um, your Q1 and Q3 will match their answers. Um, so, stat, edit. I'm going to highlight the name of the list, clear, enter, and then enter my data values. And then I definitely want to check my data values to make sure I've entered them correctly. Actually, I'll do. I did. Oh, law. <laughs> wow. I messed up really early. Oh, I'm hitting a decimal twice. Five point ah. Five point one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so five point nine, four point four, four, five point eight, five point seven, five point one, five point one. And then 6.1, 4 4.1, 4.5, 4, 4.9, 6.5, 4.9. Okay. And then stat, scroll to the right, calculate, and then one var stats. Whoops. <laughs> I know, I'm so bad on this problem. So one var stats, enter. And then we scroll to the bottom to get the five number summary. So our five number summary here would be four comma four point four comma five, five point eight, six point five. So um, four was it four point four five five point eight six point five. So that's the five number summary. Part A says um, obtain and interpret the quartile. So our Q1 is the 4.4. Our Q2 is the 5. And our Q3 is the 5.8. And so the Q1 is where the first fourth of the data 
stops. So um, one fourth data of the data is below 4.4. And then five, well that would be half of the data um, below the five. And then the 5.8, we would have three-fourths of the data below the 5.8. Does that make sense? That's what our quartiles are really telling us. And then determine and interpret the inner quartile range. The inner quartile range would be Q3 minus Q1, which is 5.8 minus 4.4, or 1.4. And what does the 1.4 tell us? What does the interquartile range tell us? The range, or the spread, of the middle half of our data is 1.4 units. So only 1.4 units from covers half of our data, the middle half of our data. So it's pretty tight. Um, of course, it's small data values. So. Are there any questions about this? So this is a typical homework sort of problem. Oops. Um, lower and upper limits. In order to find outliers, and an outlier is something that lies far away from the rest of the data. So it's a little misfit data value, poor by itself, all, all lonely off by itself. Um, that's what outliers are. In order to find outliers, which are extreme data values, we need to do lower and upper limits. And if a data value is outside of the range between the lower limit and the upper limit, then that data value is considered an outlier. Um, much of the time we won't have any outliers in our data set, maybe even most of the time. Um, if you look at all data sets, not just the book examples. But uh, sometimes we will have extreme data values, and we can find them with this formula. This formula is, again, on your formula card under Chapter 3. So if we know Q1, and we know the interquartile range, and Q3 and the interquartile range, which we do, we know how to compute those, um, we can compute the lower and upper limits. So any data value that's greater than the upper limit or less than the lower limit is an outlier. To draw, and we'll do examples with outliers in just a second, to draw a box plot, we need the five number summary, and then once we have the five number summary, we just draw a line, and then everywhere we have one of the numbers from our five number summary, we would mark with these little marks like this, and then we put a box around the ones that represent Q1, Q2, and Q3, and then we draw lines. Wow, it's shaking. Hmm. Helicopter? Okay. <laughs> That's why it's shaking. Um, then we draw lines from Q3 out to the maximum and um, from Q1 out to the minimum. And so um, that's how you draw a box plot. Uh, some books even call it a box and whisker plot because you've got the box and then you've got the little whiskers coming out. And so that's your standard box plot. You don't actually have to label the minimum Q1, Q2, Q3, and the maximum, but where you put those marks will be 
corresponding to where the minimum is and where the Q1 is, Q2, Q3. We'll do an actual example in a minute. Um, and then to do a modified box plot, that's when you need the outliers. So the only difference between the regular box plot and the modified box plot is that we um, put outliers on the modified box plot. So we do need to compute the lower, lower and upper limits and look for outliers. Once we find the outliers, we will mark the outliers with asterisks. And then when we actually do the number line, we will do, um, if we have an outlier, we will do an outlier. And then we will mark the lowest data value that is not an outlier. And we will mark Q1, Q2, Q3. So that's still the same. And then we mark the highest data value that's not an outlier. And then if we have other outliers up here, we would mark them as well. So for this one, this is the least data value, not an outlier. So it's not necessarily the minimum data value because the minimum data value may or may not be an outlier. And then this is the most data value, not an outlier. And we'll do an example of this as well. Um, so here is one particular data set, and this data set only has one outlier, and the outlier is right here. So for this data set to draw the normal box plot, they said, okay, the minimum is right here um, between 0 and 10, and then the Q1 is about 23 maybe, so they draw the line there, and then the Q2 is maybe about 32, and the Q3 is maybe about 37, and then the maximum data value is out here about 68. Um, so then, and then they draw the whiskers, so they have the boxes and the whiskers, and that's how you would draw the box plot. Basically, what you really need is the five number summary. Once you have that, it's pretty simple um, to draw the box plot. You just label the five number summary with the marks and then draw boxes and whiskers. And then, if you have a modified box plot and you actually have an outlier up here at this value that we'll say is about 67, you mark your outlier with an asterisk. And then you look at your entire data set and what's, say what the next biggest value is that's not an outlier. So here in this data set that they're talking about here, 44 about looks like the next largest data value that's not an outlier. So they say, okay, we'll mark 44 then. Um, this is still the minimum data value over here because we didn't have any outliers on that side. So it's still the same. And your Q1, Q2, Q3 will always be the same, whether you're doing normal or modified box plots. Does that make sense? Are there questions? Um, and then this is just sort of how you would draw a modified box plot. You would mark your lines. And then this would be the least data value that's not an outlier, the most data value that's not an outlier, and then your outlier. Okay, so here let's actually do a box plot with this data value set. So it's the same set we were doing earlier. Um, we want to find and interpret the five number summary. And I think we actually wrote down the five number summary earlier. Can anybody remember what it was? I'm sorry, four? Thank you. Okay, so that is C 
um, our five number summary and let me write that 4.4 a little bit better um, so that's what we got from our calculator earlier and we could have done this by hand too listing everything from least to greatest finding the median uh, finding the middle of the first half of the data set and the middle of the second half of the data set that's Q1 and Q3 and then the smallest data value is our minimum and the largest data value as our maximum. Um, interpret the five number summary. Well, these numbers really divide our data into fourths. Um, these are the first fourth, this is the second fourth, this is the third fourth, and this is the last fourth of the data set. So that's what the five number summary does is really split our data into fourths. And then identify any potential outliers. So how do we identify potential outliers? Um, were there formulas that we saw that would help us identify outliers? They were the, I'm sorry? interquartile range, but it was used in a formula for the, the lower and upper limits, right. So part D, we need to compute the lower limit, compute the upper limit, and then anything outside of the lower and upper limit is considered to be an outlier. So the formula for the lower limit was equal to times the interquartile range. And the interquartile range we computed last time to be, didn't we compute it last time? It was um, the 5.8 minus the 4.4, which gave us the 1.4. So uh, Q1 is our 4.4. And then um, minus 1.5 times the 1.4 and that will give me four point four minus one point five times one point I'm sorry two point three did anybody else get two point three Okay, um, and then the upper limit, the formula for it is and so that is going to be 5.8 minus 1.5 times 1.4 Oh, yes, thank you, plus. Seven point nine. So two point three, do we have any data values less than two point three? <coughs> no, not in this data set. Seven point nine, do we have any data values more than seven point nine? No, so we would say there are no outliers. Um, the 2.3, are there any data values less than our lower limit of 2.3? So we look at our original data and we see if there's anything in there less than 2.3, and since we know our minimum's four, we know, no, it's not. Um, and then 7.9, we look and see if there's anything less than 7.9, again, looking at our original data, and since we know that 6.5 is our maximum, we know that there's nothing more than 7.9. And so for that reason, there aren't outliers in this data set. Um, I got 2.3 by using this formula. 
So I took Q1, Q1 was our 4.4, and I subtracted one and a half times the interquartile range. The interquartile range we got in the previous problem, it's Q3 minus Q1. And so when we did that, we got 1.4. So I just plugged in 4.4 minus 1.5 times 1.4 to get the 2.3. Okay, let me um, do it on the calculator then and see if we get something different. So um, we do 4.4 minus 1.3. Five times the one point four. I'm sorry. That was if you did when I first did it, I did four point four minus one point five enter and then then I got a different number. Oh yeah, you would definitely get a different number. But the order of operations says to do the multiplication first and then the subtraction. So if you, if you do the subtraction first and then the multiplication, it's not doing it in the proper order, so it will give you a different and incorrect answer in that case. But the formula itself doesn't give precedence, so what that means is that you want to do the multiplication first, because order of operations is multiply first, and then subtract. Um, and so we're getting um, 2.3, so is that... Good. Okay. Are there any other questions on this so far? Okay. And so we've identified potential outliers. Now we need to obtain and interpret a box plot. So I'm going to erase this down here. So, ooh, I didn't like that. It may not let me erase. Um, I will try then to draw. Um, I want to draw it on here so it'll be part of the recording. Um, I'll draw it smaller right here. Um, our minimum data value is 4, so we know when we mark these we'll want to include 4, and then our maximum data value is the 6.5. So um, we'll go ahead and do... Um, Zero. Well, actually, we could put the zeros down here. Um, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we really, that's um, step one, to draw the line and label the values. And then we want to do the marks, the vertical marks at the five number summary. So we do a mark at four, and then we do a mark at 4.4, and then we do a mark at five. And then we do a mark at 5.8. And then we do a mark at 6.5. And then we'll box in the Q1, Q2, Q3, and we'll whisker the others. Are there any questions about doing the box plot? Okay, and then what that tells us that our data is spread out like this, where this is the minimum data value, um, and then the first fourth of our data set is right there um, in the first whisker. And then the second fourth of our data set is in that box, and then the third quarter of the data set is in that box, and then the last quarter of our data set is right here in that range. Are there any questions about that? 
Okay, and then 3.4, we focus on doing the population mean and the population standard deviation. These are enormously like the sample mean and the sample standard deviation that we've done before. We will apply these formulas whenever we have a population. So if we're given a data set, we'll be told whether it's a sample data set or a population data set. If we're given a population, we do the population mean and population standard deviation. If we're given a sample, we'll do what we previously talked about with the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. It turns out that the formula for the population mean is exactly the same as the formula for the sample mean. Basically, we add up all of the data values and we divide by the total. Um, notice that we have a capital N here. The capital N denotes the number of data values that are in a population. So instead of a lowercase n that denotes sample size, the capital N denotes population size. But it's still the same process. Add up all the data values and divide by how many data values there are. And then we use the symbol. It's um, called mu. And if we spell it out in English, mu, mu. Um, and then it sort of looks like an m or sort of looks like a U, depending on where you see it. Um, that's kind of how I write it. Um, and then this is how Weiss will have it in print. Um, and then N, oh, it says that N is the population size, but we've talked about that. So um, the reason, because the computation for sample size and population size is exactly the same, uh, the calculator won't give you mu separately. It will only tell you x bar, but we know when it tells us x bar, well, it's actually equal to mu because the computation's the same. So we can use x bar and mu interchangeably um, when our calculator provides it for us because it's the same way to calculate it. And then sigma is the population standard deviation. And of course, this is lowercase sigma. So if we spell that out, it's going to look like sigma. Um, and it's also a Greek letter. And of course, we've talked about this before. That's capital sigma. And then this is the lowercase sigma. And lowercase sigma is the population standard deviation. The formula for it is almost exactly the same as the formula for S, the sample standard deviation. But there is a small difference. Instead of n minus 1 in the denominator, it has n. So um, you're not subtracting the 1. And that does make a difference in the um, s and sigma. And you'll see on your calculator when it gives you both s and sigma that there is usually a slight difference between those. Um, the less data values you have, the more significant uh, a difference that will make. So if you just had a handful of data values, there might be a big difference between S and sigma. If you had a thousand data values, there would hardly be a significant difference at all between them. And um, the computing formula does look quite a bit different, um, but that's just due to some manipulation. We still want to square data values and then take their sum, so we would need to have that column. But then we divide by n and subtract mu squared. Um, so it's a little bit different on the computing formula. Um, so here sort of outlines the difference between uh, parameters and statistics. It's the difference between populations and samples. So if we have population data, then we are going to be talking about mu as the mean and sigma as the standard deviation. So if we're talking about the diameters of bolts produced at this factory ever, that would be the population. But we probably wouldn't be able to measure all of the diameters of the bolts ever produced at a particular factory. But we could take a sample of the bolts, 20 bolts, and measure their diameters and use that measurement to estimate what it would be like for the entire population. And the estimate would be x bar for the mean and then s for the standard deviation. 
And so we use sample data to estimate what the population data is because most of the time we aren't going to be able to collect everything in the population. So our best estimate is the sample. And sample data, sample, we call these statistics. Um, the X bar is a statistic and the S is a statistic. And I try to remember that because sample starts with S and statistics starts with S. And then population data, these are parameters. Um, so mu is a parameter and sigma is a parameter. And again, P population, P parameter. So a parameter is a measure for populations and a statistic is a measure for samples. Here we have a data set and we want to obtain and interpret the population mean and then the population standard deviation. So to do the population mean we would want to add up all of these data values and divide by eighteen. Okay, so um, the mean is going to be the sum of all of the data values divided by the total. 18 is the total number of data values. When I add all of these 18 values together, what do I get? Seven two four two? Seventy two fourteen. Thank you. And seven two one four divided by eighteen will give me I'm, I'm sorry? Okay, so four hundred point eight we'll call it maybe if we round. Um and so what that says is that the, and if we look at the context of the problem, these are um, lengths in yards of the 18 holes. So the average distance um, between one of the holes of the golf course to the next is going to be uh, on average 400.8 yards. Does that make sense? And then obtain and interpret the population standard deviation. When it gives us one of these problems, we can choose whether we want to use the computing formula or the defining formula, which would y'all rather use? This is the defining formula and this is the computing formula. But remember for this, we have to do the subtracting of all of the different things. This one, we just have to square the values. Let's, yeah, let's go ahead and do the computing. So um, we would need to make a table. I'm going to erase so we could make a table with all of the values and then all of the x squared values. So um, we would need to do x and x squared. So 401 and the square of 401 would be I'm sorry, 16 Is that right? Did Or did I mishear you? Okay. And then 607 squared would be 36. Thank you. And then 469 squared. 961. Okay. And then 
um, 476 and then um, 336 I'm sorry And then four four nine. And then five six five. Three one nine two two five. Okay. And then three seven eight. Oops, I need my comma here then. Um, and then 472. And then 468. And then 220. And then 203. And then 404. Um, 16. Oh, 32. Okay. 16, 32, 16. Okay, and then, so that doesn't really look. 163, comma, 216. So, and then 492. Two, four, two, zero, zero, Two four two zero six four and four sixty seven two one eight zero eight nine um one ninety three six one zero zero okay one seventy five Thirty thousand. Okay, and then we've, I've really run out of space. So for the four four two. One nine five three six four. One nine five three six four. Sorry, <laughs> I should have written smaller or be taller. I should have started taller. Um, then we need to add all of the x values. So the sum of the x values. So we would add all of these and this one. But of course, we've already added those, right? That gave us a total of, I'm sorry, 7214. Right, we're not doing the square yet. We still need to do the square, too. So 7214 is that. And then the square of them, we add all of these plus this one. I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, just make a guess. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. 316968. So, three million, not too far from two million, three million one hundred sixty-nine thousand two hundred and sixty-eight. And so then we would use that um, for computing 
this. So this would be the 3,169,268 for the sum of x squared. Our n value would be 18. And then mu, let's see, mu was, um, well, we actually divided that by 18 to get, yeah, the 400.8 squared. And so if we do this, this will be sigma equals the square root of 3169268 divided by 18 minus, and really we may be better off to do the, um, so we don't get rounding error, 7214 divided by 18 squared. That way we won't get any rounding error. Or if you wanted to, you could substitute um, this as your 400.8 but this will give us no rounding here. If we do this in our calculator all at once, we'll definitely want parentheses here and parentheses here. Um, we'll also want parentheses here to denote that this is all squared. So, um, what will that give us? Four nineteen point point three one three. So we'll just go ahead and leave it as four nineteen point one. And are there any questions on that? Did other people get that? That's seventy two fourteen, and you did use seventy two fourteen, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, seven, so um, let me do this on, yes, save. So I'll do it on the calculator together too. So square root, oh wow, it's taking a long time to write all of that. So it was 3 million... Thank you. Divided by 18 minus, in parentheses, 7214 divided by 18 squared. Um, if we had only put in 400.8, we wouldn't need to divide it. But instead of doing 400.8, right, okay. that way I don't get rounding error. Okay, but are you good now with where I got that from? Okay. And then our answer should have been 124.3. Is that what other people are getting now? So that's our sigma. So let's put all of these data values into the calculator, do it the calculator way, and hopefully sigma on the calculator will be 124.288 exactly. If we had used 400.8, we would have gotten almost the same thing. So let me change this to 400.8. So 400.8, and then I'll delete this rest of it. We still have to square it. I'm sorry? I, I don't um, use parentheses unless I know that it won't follow the order of operations that I want it to, you know, without it. So I definitely have parentheses around um, the right here around 
this because it won't put everything under the square root if I don't. And then I also have up here parentheses around this because I want it to square everything. But here, um, I know that it's going to square this number, so there's no need for parentheses. Here, I know it's going to do this division before it does the subtraction, so I don't put it in parentheses. Okay, so instead of the 419, then, we should really have the 124.2, was it? 0.3? Yeah, 0.3. Um, now let's do it on the calculator. So, stat, edit. Oh, that's how you did it? Okay. So, my first number is 401, 607, 469, 476. <laughs> On the test, I let you use your calculator a lot. <laughs> I, I'm a big advocate of the calculator, but I also want you to know how to do it by hand. Um, so I'll look on your homework when I'm grading it and make sure that you do it by hand when it's asked to be done by hand. Um, because I think that you should know how to do it by hand, but I also... I'm a big advocate of, you know, I'm sorry, I, I got the, the most previous one wrong, 492, okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to make you spend $200 for a calculator and then not let you use it, right? Of course, I hope you didn't spend $200 for the calculator because you could have gotten it at Walmart. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so checking all of our data, we certainly with 18 data values would want to check the data values and make sure we've entered them correctly. So 401, 607, 469, 476, 476, and then 336. 449, 565, um, 378, 472, 468, um, 220, 203, 404, 402, 467, 190, 175, 442, um, and then stat calc one var stats enter, and sigma is 124.288. So it gives us more accuracy when we actually plug in how we computed the mu squared um, versus rounding the mu. Are there any questions on this? We've got it down good? Okay. Um, then there's just another short little bit about standardizing data that's in Chapter 3. So um, the wonderful thing about bell-shaped curves is that we can standardize our data. So if we have normal distributions, and we'll assume that um, the height of adults is normally distributed among the females and then also normally distributed among males, <coughs> so data can be standardized um, and we can compare how many standard deviations um, someone is from the mean. So remember that being three standard deviations or more away from the mean is going to be extremely rare, especially with normal, normally distributed data because only three in a thousand would be outside of the three standard deviations. Here we have Michael Jordan and Rebecca Lobo, so we could probably expect both of them to be extremely and unusually tall, um, but we want to know who's taller. 
Well, clearly Michael Jordan is two inches taller than Rebecca Lobo because he's 78 inches tall and Rebecca Lobo is 76 inches tall. But, relatively speaking, who is going to be the taller of the two when we consider gender? So, if we look at men, the average height of men is 69 inches with a standard deviation of 2.8. And women is 63.6 inches. Um, I'm far below that, <laughs> with a standard deviation of 2.5. Um, so who would be considered taller? Well, we have this wonderful z-score that we can use to standardize things. Z, we take um, whatever our data value is, 78 and 76, since Jordan 78 inches tall and Rebecca Lobo 76 inches tall. Uh, we subtract the mean, and we divide by the standard deviation. And that will tell us how many standard deviations Michael Jordan is from the mean of males. And then we will look at Rebecca Lobo and see how many standard deviations she is above the mean. And that way we have something com to compare. And whoever z-score is more will be taller, relatively speaking. Does that make sense? Okay. No. So we're considering the mean of men for Jordan, and we're dividing by the standard deviation of men. So how many standard deviations Michael Jordan is from his mean? And then we'll look at how many standard deviations Rebecca Lobo is from her mean. Um, since it's standardized, that'll tell us, relatively speaking, uh, when we consider all of the data, how extreme Michael Jordan is versus how extreme Rebecca Lobo is. Okay, um, so the z-score for uh, Jordan, Jordan was 78 inches tall, and so then we subtract the 69, that's the mean, so z equals x minus mu over sigma, so x is the 78 that Michael Jordan is, our, our mu is the 69, and our sigma is the 2.8. If we're putting this all in the calculator all at once, again, do parentheses around the numerator, and what will we get? You have what? 3.21? Wow, so Michael Jordan is more than three standard deviations away from the mean. But we kind of expected that, didn't we? He's extremely tall. And then Rebecca Lobo, her height was 76 inches tall. Um, her mean is 63.6, and we're dividing by her standard deviation, which is 2.5. Again, put parentheses around it if you're putting it in the calculator all at once, and we get 4.96. Wow. So she is really, really, really tall. Um, a good bit taller, relatively speaking, than Michael Jordan. Does that make sense? Um, if we looked at the mean of every single z-score possible, so um, if we looked at everybody in the United States and computed their z-score, mine would be negative, um, denoting that I'm below the mean on height. Um, so um, the short people would have negative numbers, the average people would be zero, the tall people would have positive numbers. The mean of all z-scores, no matter what the data set is, is always going to be zero because on average, people will be zero distance from the mean, because the mean is the average. And then the standard deviation is always going to be one, if you took the standard deviation of all z-scores, because again, that's kind of just averaging the standard deviation so that it's one. So by the nature of standardized scores, 
the mean is always going to be zero and the standard deviation is always going to be one. And of course, we know because of Chebyshev's rule and the empirical rule that almost all of our data is going to be between z scores of three and negative three. Eighty-nine percent in the case of um, normal or non-normal data, um, at least 89 percent. And then if we know the data is normal, the empirical rule says 99.7 percent of our data is going to be within three standard deviations, so between three and negative three on the z-scores. And that's it, I think. Yep. So phew, we finished right by 11. So if you have questions, you can come ask me.